And I want you to help me out a little bit this morning. I need you to participate. If you are this morning a follower of Jesus Christ, I want you to think back for a moment. I want you to think back for a moment to the time in which you trusted Christ with your life, that when you began your journey of following Jesus. For some of us, it's probably been maybe a long time ago when that happened. And I, I trusted Christ when I was 10 years old back in 1987, but that was just the beginning of the journey. And so as we think about that time and that moment, now think about how you have matured in your faith, or if you have matured in your faith. And think about for a moment, think about the, the places and the people and the events that the Lord has used to get you to this particular point. Because the reality is we should have these spiritual benchmarkers in our lives. And, and some of those benchmarkers were the mountaintop experiences in life. But also, some of those spiritual benchmarkers are the valleys of the life. We seem to, to grow most in the valleys of life. But I do know, probably like you, one thing that I understand is that being around Christianity and being a Christian is not the same thing. It's not the same thing. Many of you were raised around Christianity. You had a lot of Christian people in your life, but that does not make you a Christian. I've heard people say, just like you have heard people say, well, I've just always been a Christian. Well, no, you haven't. It doesn't work that way. Nobody's always been a Christian. We become a Christian when we're born again through a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And my question is, when did that happen to you? When did that happen to you? And if you're here today and, and you, you can't nail that down, you, you can't think of that time, I'm glad you're here today because we need to have a conversation. All of us need to have a conversation today because some of, the, some of us make the mistake early on in our Christian journey of confusing spiritual activity, maturity with spiritual activity. The more spiritual things to do, the more spiritual you are. You go to church and you watch other people and the way that they live for the Lord and, and they were, they're faithful to God and you begin to think, man, uh, what do I need to do in order to be a good Christian? I, I got to really try hard to, to do all the right things and not do all the wrong things. And that becomes the all-consuming passion of your life. I love the way that Henry Blackaby, the author of Experience in God, states that he says, we are so actively oriented that we assume we are saved for a task to perform rather than a relationship to enjoy. That statement that we see there is the epitome of our spiritual journey of walking with God. We think that we have been saved to do something, to do something and the focus of our life becomes spiritual performance trying very hard to live the Christian life. Can anybody else in the room identify with me about that? Am I the only one that, that, that finds himself in that situation? But no matter how hard you try, you, you never get to that point to where you say, well, I finally made it. You, you never arrive when you're in that mentality. And, and that's why when you get to some verses in the Bible they don't make a lot of sense. I want to read a couple of them to you this morning. Here's the first one. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Those three words Rest, easy, light. How do those three words measure up with your experience of, of a Christian living? For, for some of you, you, you could not have picked three words that were the more opposite of how you're trying to live your life. For it's, it's not rest, it's, it's work. It's not easy, it's hard it's not light, it's a, it's a burden. 
And if you were to describe Christianity, you would say, work hard. And it's a, it's a burden because you're working hard and you're trying to use all the willpower that you can muster to be what you think is a good, faithful Christian. Rest, easy, light, or as far removed from your life as the moon is from the earth at this very moment. Let me show you another verse. John chapter 8, verse 32. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What a great word. What a great word. Come, come to Jesus and he will set you free. But you're thinking, well, what's, what's all this freedom talk? I don't feel freedom. Instead of freedom, you have a burden to perform. Jesus has brought me to himself and he's given me a turn at life. And now it's my responsibility. Now I got to live for him. But it's not until you've been walking with God for any length of time and you, you come to this season of brokenness, a place where God brings you to one of those moments that's kind of the end of yourself, where you have nothing, you have nothing left but him to come to. But then there's the amazing realization that he's enough. I share with this with you last week, and I want to share it again today. The primary call of my life is not to do something for Jesus. The primary call on my life is to be with Jesus. What he has invited us into, friends, is he has invited us into not a system of do's and don'ts and rights and wrongs, rules and regulations. What he's invited us into is an intimate love relationship with himself. The God who made me, who God and made everything God desires to do through my life, he will do all of those things out of the overflow of a love relationship with him. Meaning this, the relationship wasn't the starting line and then I stepped into a, to living the Christian life. No, the relationship is the whole deal. The whole goal is the relationship and everything else in my life flows out of that personal relationship and fellowship with God. So last weekend what I did is I, I gave you a couple of goals of the Christian life and I really want to give those goals to you again this morning. The, the big picture overall goal is this and that is to, to know God. To know God. That's, that's the big picture. John chapter 17 verse 3 says, and this is eternal life. He's defining eternal life here, that they may know you. He didn't define eternal life as a destination. He defined eternal life as a relationship. The big picture goal is to know God. He's invited us into a relationship with himself so that now and into eternity we can know him. And if that's the big picture goal, here's the daily goal. The daily goal is to spend time with God. That's it. So here's what that means. You know why we're here today? You know why you're here today? You're not at church because they keep attendance records in heaven. Amen? Now, we do a pretty decent job of it here. Some of you slip through the cracks, right? But we don't, we're not here today because they keep attendance records in heaven. Oh, yeah, he's, he's here today. We can check that off. We're so glad that he came this morning. He's got his attendance records still going. Let's keep that going. No. We're not here today because I, I've got to come to church to be a good Christian and, and to show God. No. Let me tell you why you're here today. We're here today because together, together, we get to be with him. And together, God speaks into our lives through community. We get to know him. Why do we have a God time, a quiet time every day? Why is that? Why do we strive to set aside time daily to just to just be alone with God. I set time alone daily to, to be alone with God, not because I have to to be a good Christian. He's invited you and me into a relationship with himself so that I can know him. I don't read my Bible because I have to to earn God's favor. We read the Bible to be with him. The whole Christian life is knowing God and being with him. And through Jesus, you know what that is? It's rest. It's easy. It's light. You know what that is? That's freedom. It's, I'm free to be with him. 
And so what I want to do this morning is I, I want to dig a little deeper on this idea of spending time with him by asking some big questions this morning. And some of these things are going to be for us to chew on this morning. And some of these questions that I'm going to ask are going to be very difficult for us this morning. They are meant and designed to push us this morning. Some of these questions that I'm going to ask you, one particular may even make you a little bit angry if your heart's not right. So why is it important to spend time with him? Why is it, why is it such a big deal? And so like a politician, what I'm going to do this morning is I am going to answer your question by answering more questions, right? Is that how you do it? Is that how it works? Okay, that's what I'm going to do. And here's the other thing. When I answer these questions or ask you these questions this morning, don't answer them out loud, okay? Just don't answer them out loud. I'm just trying to protect you, trying to be a friend, trying to be a blessing. Don't answer them out loud. So here's the first question. Does a Christian want to sin? Does a Christian want to sin? Now, on the surface, you say yes. I, if I didn't want to sin, there would be, be no reason for temptation. Well, that's sort of true. In, in your flesh, there's still this longing for the things of the world. But now the Spirit of God, if you're a follower of Jesus, now the Spirit of God dwells in you. And Christ has changed you on the inside so that now that in your heart of hearts, you really don't want to sin. Here's the proof. When you do choose to sin today, how do you feel about that? When you do choose to sin against God, if you're a follower of Jesus, immediately you know it. And you realize that's not what I wanted. My flesh said, that's what you wanted, but as soon as I grab whatever that is, as soon as I dabble in whatever that is, that temptation is, as soon as I lay a hold of it, immediately I realize, you know what, that's not really what I wanted. Christ has now done a thing on the inside. He's still perfecting us, and it's, and it's coming out in our daily life. He's growing us into Christ's likenesses. He's changed us. So now that I know no longer want to sin. Instead, now, instead of sinning, I want to please God. I want to pursue his righteousness. I want to pursue his holiness. I want the character of Christ in my life. Now, like you, I don't always perfectly keep that, but that's now the God-given desire that he's placed in me and every follower of Jesus. So the answer to that question is no. As a Christian, I genuinely don't want to sin. So here's the second question for us. Does a Christian have to sin? Does a Christian have to sin? And before you answer that question, I want to read a couple of verses to us this morning. Starting with Romans chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for one who has died has been set free from sin. And then we move to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Here's what he said. In every moment of temptation and every moment of weakness in my life. It's not about my faithfulness. It's about the faithfulness of God. And God is always faithful to provide. And in every moment of temptation, by his Holy Spirit, through his grace, he has provided a way for us to escape so that you and I, in every temptation that we have, we have the possibility in Christ to experience victory over sin. Now, I know what some of you may be thinking this morning. What about my depravity? Well, the word depravity means apart from the grace of God, we would all run headlong into all forms of wickedness. Mankind comes into the world depraved. We're totally depraved. That's why you don't have to teach little boys and girls how to do bad. They, you have to teach them how to do good. All of that comes prepackaged naturally, right? We come into this world with a nature, by nature, with a sin nature. We do not have the ability, apart from the grace of God, to please God and to live for God. 
But did you hear the definition that I gave of depravity? Apart from the grace of God, we would all run headlong into every form of wickedness. As a follower of Jesus, you and I never have to be apart from the grace of God. Never. As a matter of fact, Romans chapter 5 says that it's by grace in which we now stand as followers of Jesus. You and I have been rooted and we have been planted in the amazing grace of God that is always available to you to give victory over temptation. Let me show you another verse, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. And so here's what that means. The moment you came to know Jesus Christ, God gave you by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit of God everything you need to live the, the, the victorious Christian life. Everything. We don't have to wait. We don't have to go to some class. We don't have to have some experience. The moment that you gave your life to Christ, God supernaturally, by his divine power, gave you everything you need to live the victorious Christian life. So the answer to that second question, does a Christian want to sin, is no. A Christian doesn't want to sin. A Christian doesn't have to sin. So here's the next question, and here's the one that begins to pry a little bit. If a Christian... As a Christian, you don't want to sin, and as a Christian, you don't have to sin. Why do Christians sin? Why is it? And to that answer to that question is found, I believe, in John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Maybe like you, most of you growing up in life, you heard that verse, and here's what you heard when you heard that voice, verse. You love me? You better obey me. It's what you heard. It's the way that most religion practices and even packages this verse as it relates to God. If you love God, you better change the way that you live. If you love God, then, then you better do this and this and this. And if you love God, then you better not do this and this and this. So now when you hear the verse that way, the focus of your life begins to be obedience i got to show God that I love him by performing. i got to show God I love him through my obedience. i got to show God that I love him by doing all the right things and not doing all the wrong things. If your focus is on obedience, how's that working out for you right now? Because we try harder and harder and harder, and the harder we try, the worse it seems to get. But listen to this verse when it's relationship driven as it's designed. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. The emphasis is not on keep my commandments. The emphasis is on do you love me? When you hear it like that, it, it changes the pursuit. The pursuit is not obedience. Obedience is not the focus. Now, I'm not saying that obedience is not important, but get this. Obedience is not the focus of my life. Obedience is now the fruit of my life. And that happens as I pursue and focus on an intimate relationship with my Father because as I love Him, He produces obedience in and through my life. If our obedience, though, is in direct proportion to love, that means, are you ready? That if I'm struggling, it's not an obedience problem. It's a love problem. And here's what I'm saying. I just happen to love that more than I love him. And Jesus said, if you want to keep my commandments, it's the overflow of loving me. So I want to help us out this morning with some paradigms, and I put them on the screen. I want to start off with the word sin at the top up there. And I've said so far that we sin because we don't love God. And when I say that, I'm not saying that we don't love God at all. What I mean is that when I choose to sin against God, 
when I have areas where I struggle in my obedience, when I'm wrestling with those things in my life, where I have weaknesses, here's the reality. I just love those things more than I love him. And here's what I found. I can't pursue that the same time I'm pursuing him. Try it with me for a second. Whatever that is, Whatever that area is, if I start pursuing him, guess what happens what I found out? I can't pursue that and him at the same time. When I'm pursuing him, guess what happens? That gets left behind. And so in that moment, I'm trying to muster up all the willpower. What I'm, what I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. How's that working out, trying to will up the willpower to do all those things? We're, we're doing our best impersonation of that, that, that little kid. When we say, don't touch that button or don't touch that wet paint sign or wet paint because it's wet. That's what we're doing there. For some reason, we come into this world and now everything that we want to do wants to touch that wet paint or hit that button. Right? That's all of us. Jesus didn't say, don't, 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 don't. He said, pursue me. And, and, and when you pursue him, guess what happens? The things, the, the things like the old hymn writer said, grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. It's not that we don't love him at all. It says we don't love him like we could love him. Well, that leads to another question. Why don't we love him? Well, the answer is because we don't know God. Again, I'm not, I'm not saying that we don't know God at all. It's just that we don't know him like we could know him. Let me illustrate this to you this way. And I've used this illustration before, so just humor me, but I want to take a different angle at it. On, on my wedding day, I stood in front of a congregation much like you on my wedding day, all dressed up in a tuxedo that seven other people had already worn to get married in, right? Just like you did. My wife stood there in a, in a new dress as a bride, beautiful, She's in her dress. She stood in front of the congregation, and we declared, and I declared to her that I love her, and I love her before the Lord, and I want her to be to my wife. And I said, Kimberly, I love you, and I meant that with all my heart, right? Kids are like, you better. And I love her today like I never could love her back in 1999 because I know her today better than I could have known her in 1999. And the more I've grown to know her, the more I've grown to love her. And the problem with most Christians is our knowledge of God begins and ends with the gospel. Now, don't misunderstand me. The gospel is good news, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not die but have everlasting life. That's the good news. But that's just one verse God gave us 66 books, and the rest of it's not filler, I promise. God wrote this so that, that you could know about that love. God wrote this so that you could know about his sovereignty. God wrote this so that you could know about his grace. God wrote this so that you could know about his faithfulness. God wrote this as a love letter so that you could know about his goodness. God wrote this so that you and I could daily have intimate fellowship with him. And the Word of God becomes a centerpiece of a conversation between me and my Father. God invites us to know Him. Well, there's another question. Well, why don't we know Him more? Well, here's the answer. We don't spend time with Him. You know, what's the made the difference in my marriage? The difference for 22 years is that we've spent a lot of time together. I know my wife today as a life partner, as a mother, as a faithful follower of Jesus. I know so much more about her because I spent so much more time together with her. The more I've grown to know her, the more I love her. But what if, hypothetically, what if I had gone to my wife when I asked her to marry me back sometime in 1998, whenever that was, I should probably know that day. It should have it tattooed somewhere on my body so I don't forget it, right? And what if I got down on one knee and said, I want to ask you to be my wife, and here's what's going to happen. I'm going to come see you every Sunday morning for about an hour and a half, and, and, and maybe even two, unless, 
unless there, there's, there's a ball game or if the weather's real pretty outside or, or I just feel like sleeping in that morning. But, but other than that, I, I'll, I'll come see you every Sunday morning. Kimberly, I love you even so much that, how about this? We we'll love you so much that I might even get together during the middle of the week with some friends, and, and, and we're going to invite you to come over and be with us, okay? Now, if I need something, you're going to know I'm here, right? You're going to know I need something. As a matter of fact, if I need something, I'm not only going to call you, but I'm also going to have all of my friends to call you so to get your attention so that you can know that I need something. And when I need something, I mean I need it right now. Now, some of you are giggling, smirking, scared to laugh out loud right now. You don't know what to do because you don't know where I'm going with this. We're laughing because that's ridiculous. No woman in her right mind would accept a marriage proposal like that. And no man in his right mind would make one in arm's reach of that particular woman either, right? Why? Because that's just not allowed in a marriage relationship. You can, you can never know anybody like that. And we laugh about that. But what we say is, God, I want to give you my life. I want you to be the center of my life. I want everything in my life to revolve around you, Jesus. God, I'm going to surrender my life to you. And here's the deal. I'll meet with you once a week if my schedule lines up with it. And then we wonder, friends, we wonder why we struggle in this thing called the Christian life. Here's why. We struggle. We struggle because he's invited us into a relationship, and you can't develop a relationship without time spent. It just doesn't work. You can't put God in a Sunday morning small group box and expect to live the Christ, victorious Christian abundant life and he's, that he's invited us into. Because the abundant, victorious life happens out of the overflow of a relationship with him. And the only way to cultivate the relationship is to spend time together. So then, well, why, why don't we spend more time with God? Well, here's the answer. We don't see the need. Now, let me illustrate it for you this way. How many of you, I want you to raise your hands. How many of you would say today, spending time with God daily is a good thing to do? We're in church. I'd expect that. Y'all lie in church. No, I'm just playing. That's in church. Here's the second question. How many of you would say that spending time with God daily would benefit and bless my life? All right. How many of you believe that spending time with God daily is an absolute necessity? Really? I'd have boxed you into a corner now. You see, the lives we live don't reflect what we just said with our hands a lot of times. We just said it's an absolute necessity to be with him. But the way we live our lives says differently. Here's what we really believe. Spending time with God daily is a really, 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 really good option. I don't have to. I mean, I can live today without him. I can make it through the week on my own. You know the problem with this particular type of thinking? It's just the opposite of what Jesus said. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And you know the problem? We think he said, apart from me, you can't do big things. Because let big things come into your life, and guess what? You instantly got time to spend with Jesus. Instantly. Instantly. But if it's just a regular, ordinary, everyday kind of run-of-the-mill week, it's just a good option. No. Jesus said nothing. You can do nothing. And here's what that means. Today, I will fail as a husband apart from Christ in me. Today, I will fail as a pa father apart from Christ in me. Today, I will fail as a pastor apart from Christ in me. Today, I will fail as a friend apart from Christ in me. Today, I will fail miserably as a follower of Jesus Christ because apart from him, I can not do nothing. But through him, I can do all things. How many of you breathe every day, right? Some of you got to wake up to answer that question. It is hot in here. Is it not hot in here? 
If you don't breathe, guess what's going to happen? You're going to stop living. So don't stop breathing, okay? Because we got stuff to do for just a few minutes. Wait till you get out. No, I'm just playing. You don't even think about it. Why? It's just natural. Because if you stop breathing, you stop living. It's an absolute necessity. You just breathe. How many of you are going to eat today? Y'all are lying. <laughs> Some of you are going to eat one, two, three, four, five, six times today you're going to eat, right? Right? I'm looking at the front row on that one. You're going to eat. Why do you eat every day? Because you stop eating, you stop living. It's a necessity. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Here's what that means. Today, I need God as much as I need breath in my body. And I need God as much as I need food in my body. We often don't see the need. We think that our spending time with God, that's just an option. So here's the last rung in the paradigm. Why don't we see the need? We don't see the need because of pride. Pride says, God, I don't need you. Now, I don't think anybody in this room is bold enough this morning to pull out of your driveway and say, God, I just don't need you today. I'm good. We're not bold enough to say it that way. But listen, every day that we go through the day without being with him, here's what we are in essence saying about our lives. God, I don't need you today. I can do this on my own. Now, those of you who've had children know that your kids go through all kinds of stages of independence, right? And the first stage that I can really remember that really kind of grabs a hold to you is when they're usually about two or three years old. And one of the areas that it seems to begin with is the event of putting on your shoes, tying your shoes for a two and three year old you're trying to load up the van you're trying to get everything together trying to to go somewhere and you say hey let me put on your shoes for you and what does your kid say no i want to do it myself all of your children were just submissive and they did everything that you told them to do right and you say okay go ahead and you hand them the shoes and what does that look like a train wreck is what it looks like. I mean, they do everything wrong. They, they, they put them on backwards. They put them on the wrong foot. They wrap the laces around their legs. They're trying to do everything they can to get them on, and they finally can't do it, and they wind up throwing that shoe across the room. And after a few minutes, a few minutes of frustration begin to go by and pass. They come to you, and they say, Daddy, can you help me with my shoes? And what do we do? We could cut two different directions there. <laughs> this is what we're supposed to do, parents. Sure, we set them down in our lap, and you say, okay, give me your hands, and you put their hands into your hands, and you say, you take those two, and you loop them over, and pull it under, and pull it that way. You make a little loop, and you loop it over, and then you pull it like that, just like that. And you've got their hands in your hands the whole time, and then you just let go. And the whole time, you, you know the deal, but your kids are looking up to you and you're saying, Daddy, I tied my shoe. And you're thinking, no, you didn't. <laughs> you, you, you did it th through us, or you did it through me. And that's just a simplistic story, but here, here's the deal. How many days is our Father wanting to manifest his very life in and through us? And he's waiting just to, to take our hands, our heads, our minds, our hearts, our bodies, and just live his life through us. And yet too often our attitudes are, no, Dad, I can do it by myself. I don't need you to be with me today. No big things on the agenda today. I can make it today on my own. And then what happens is, we wind up doing whatever it is that day, and we throw it across the room in frustration because we fail at it. And then we wind up crawling back into his presence. Let me show you this. James chapter 4, verse 6, but he gives more grace. 
Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. The word opposes there means to stiff arm. When you and I come to God and say, God, I got this. I don't need you. I'm good. Here's what God does. All right. Help yourself. Help yourself. And what does that usually wind up looking like? Failure, frustration, discouragement, despondency. Look what he says he gives. What's the word? He gives grace. What a, what a good word. What a good word. Grace is God doing in and through me what I could not do on my own. That's great grace. Grace is God doing through me what I do not have the capacity to do on my own. When I approach him in humility saying, God, I need you. Lord, Lord, today I need to be with you. Here's what the Bible says he does. He just gives grace. He just gives grace. And so, so what I want to do now is I want to flip that paradigm and run through it from the bottom up. First of all, we, when we approach God with humility, and here's what humility says. God, I need you. Here, here's how that looks for me sometimes in my personal quiet time. And I don't want you to think that I wake up every day with the sound of angels singing with this great desire to, to spend time with God every morning. That's not how I wake up. I wake up just like you do every morning. My calendar is full. I got stuff to do. The last thing that I want to do is sit down and be with God. I got, I'm ready to get on with the day. I got stuff to do. Here's the way that my time, my God time, begins sometimes. Lord, today you know my heart. You know my heart. I don't really want to be here. God, I know your word teaches me how much I need you. And even though I don't want to be here today, even though my heart wants to be somewhere else, my heart wants to get up and, and to walk away from this book and do something else, God, I need your grace. Here's what I know from your word. Apart from you, I can do nothing. And when we approach him like that, here's what he does. He gives grace. He infuses grace. And we begin to grow and we open the book and we spend time with him. And when we see the need, we spend, we spend time with him. We spend time with God. And the more that we spend time with God, guess what? The more that we know God. And the more that we know him, guess what? The more that we love him. And the more that you love him, guess what? The things of the world go strangely dim and the fruit of obedience is produced. Now, I want to close with another diagram because we hear today, we're here today, and we hear something like this today. And, and let me tell you how we normally respond. And I want to put the word temptation up there on the screen. And this really applies to the temptation, to any temptation, but specifically we're talking about the temptation of not wanting to be with him. Tomorrow morning, you and I are going to face the temptation to not want to be with the Lord. If I was a betting man, it's a pretty safe bet. How do we respond to this? Well, here's what we typically do. We, we hear a sermon like this. We, we go to some conference, we read some book about devotional life, and some of us have already said in our hearts, we've said it, man, that's so right. He's, what he's saying so dead on. So, so where I'm, that's where I'm living right now. That's so true. So tar starting tomorrow, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to carve out some time in the morning. I'm going to be with him. I'm going to be with God. I'm going to get my Bible. I'm going to get my notebook. I'm going to be ready. I'm going to spend time with God. And here's what happens. For the next four to six days, man, we do good. We have some temporary success. As a matter of fact, you come in walking on a Sunday morning after these times like Ole Miss has just beat Austin P. I I mean, you are really, really beaming there. You're strutting. I did it. I'm doing it. And then what happens? We blow it. Failure. We miss a day, maybe two, then we become discouraged and we, we think, man, I could have done so much better. I, I'm, I'm such a bad Christian. Why can't I live like everybody else? Why do I always fail? And we just keep repeating this over and over again. 
Then we go hear somebody else teach and then we go to a Bible conference or we go to some camp or some retreat and we read some new book. We go to some small group and then all of a sudden we hear the same thing again about being with the Father. And that's so true. Why didn't I get it last time? I'm going to do it this time. I'm going to get it right. This time, I'm going to get an accountability partner with me. I'm going to get somebody to hold me accountable to spending time daily with God. This time, maybe you make it two or three weeks, and then you think, man, I'm doing so well. I need to be leading a small group of how to do this. I'm so good at it right now. Right? It's been a month, and I hadn't even missed a day. Then what happens? We fail again. We go back to those dark places of discouragement and despondency and spiritual depression. Why can't I do better? It's the merry-go-round of the flesh is what it is. But did you hear all the eyes? I could do better. I'm going to do it. You know what that is? That's trying to wheel power through it all. It's pride is what it is that's making this model go round. But can I show you a better way today? Let's put temptation back up there. This time in the morning when you get up, I can't do it. I can't do it. In my own strength, I won't do it. God, here's what I know. In my weakness, your strength is made perfect. So God, I can't. And here's what happens. He gives grace. He gives grace. And when he gives grace, guess what happens? I experience victory. And when I experience victory and get around some other Christians and they go like, hey, something's changed about you. What's happening? It's not, well, I've got this great one, two, three system for a quiet time. No, it's, hey, don't look at me. Look at him. It's him. It's Christ in me. And God gets the glory. Now, this doesn't mean that we're still not tempted. It means stuff will still come our way that makes us battle our flesh. But here's what it means. I, I've got a new way, and it's not me. It's Christ in me that's doing it. Then we put that circle in the middle, and it's, it's humility. It's, I'm experiencing the ascending spiral of his grace as I live. I can't, Lord. I won't, Lord. But, God, I know you can, so I am trusting you today. And all across this room today, some of you need to stop trying to live the Christian life and just surrender yourself to Jesus today. Surrender yourself to Christ so that he can live through you. Some of you this morning, when I asked the opening question, was there a time when you put your trust in Christ, you had nothing? You had nothing. You've been around Christians your whole life. You've been around the church your whole life, but you've never owned it. You've never owned it. You've never taken that step of faith. You've never experienced the great exchange, his life for yours. Jesus gave his life. He gave his life so that you can have new life. Not one by our own willpower and determination, but one of freedom and grace. Quit trying to do it on your own. That's pride. That's pride that only leads to a burden. And we have to come to grips with the words that Jesus says. Come to me, all of you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest. Easy. Light. That's what that relationship's about. And that's what's available to you today. Father, we are thankful this morning that we can know you and that we can know you in a deep and an intimate way. Father, this morning, I pray that we could be honest with you, honest with ourselves, that pride drives so much of our spiritual condition. But Lord, we don't want to live a life of pride. Lord, but we want to live a life of humility. Because it's in our humility where you give great grace. And Father, we know that we can do nothing apart from knowing you and the grace that you so freely give 
in a relationship with you. Father, my prayer is that if there's someone here today who's never experienced that grace, who does not have a relationship with you, God, as you are calling them to yourself in this very moment, God, that they would not quench the spirit, but God, that they would act in obedience and following you and trusting you with all of their heart and all of their being. Father, for the rest of us who are followers of Jesus, Father, I pray that you give us the courage to remove the idol of pride in our life so that we can know the freedom that we have to be with you, to know you in a deep way. And Father, whatever it is in our life that's the barrier between you and us, whether it be a sin pattern, whether it be pride, whatever it may be, God, that we would be more concerned about being with you than anything else in our life. Father, stir our hearts in this moment as we worship together. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, if you've never trusted Christ, today's the day. I want to invite you. If you've never trusted Christ, I'll be right here. Come and take me by the hand and say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ. Friends, as always, these altars are open. Whatever it is that you need to sacrifice on the altar, you do that today. Whatever idol it may be, to know that God loves you and he desires to know you. And it's about being and not doing. And the relationship drives the whole thing. May that be the priority of our life. Let's stand together and let's sing.